Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact, or NPV. My name is Ann Thompson. I'm spokesperson for the League of Women Voters of Larimer County. First, a little bit about the League of Women Voters. We are a nonpartisan political organization, which means we never support candidates or political parties. We do take positions on issues based on study and consensus by the membership. We are working to make democracy work for all people, all voters. We envision a democracy where every person has the desire, the right, the knowledge, and the confidence to participate. The League is not for women only. So we encourage you to join the League and to check our website for upcoming events and activities. The website is lwv larimercountyorg This program is being presented as part of our series of monthly meetings, most of which are open to the public. This month's meeting was organized by our election reform team headed by Kathleen Schmidt. We thank them for this opportunity and you can find out more about the election reform team under our work tab at the league website. So we're here to learn about the NPV compact. The league has supported a popular vote for the presidency for 50 years. The major effect of this interstate compact, if it goes into effect, is that United States citizens would be voting as individuals for president of the United States rather than voting for our state's combined votes for president. The Colorado legislature passed a bill in 2019 joining Colorado to the NPV compact, which was signed by the Colorado governor. It is now on this year's ballot for voters to approve. Many people are asking, what is the NPV compact? What will it mean for Colorado when it joins the compact? How can we explain it to our friends and our neighbors? Tonight's webinar is intended to provide knowledge about the NPV compact and hopefully answer to those questions. We will start out with a 30 minute documentary film called Winner Take All. This film named official selection of the 2019 Awareness Festival and 2020 Angelus Doc Festival explains how the Electoral College came to be. Its impact on the United States legislative policy and current efforts to make elections more representative of the will of the people. It specifically focuses on Colorado. The film will be followed by a short presentation from Colorado State Senator Mike Foote. And we will then open it up for questions. Now we realize that the opinions of some audience members may not represent the league's position, but that's okay. We are all here to have a respectful discussion and learn about the issue. All right, all right, all right. Welcome everybody to our National Popular Vote webinar. And I wanted to start by thanking the producer of the Winner Take All film, uh, Don Colosino, who is actually on this call with us uh, tonight. And hopefully uh, Don can um, say a few words or say hi in the chat box. Uh, Francis, I see your question about sending a direct link that you can forward. If you look about five chats up, I've put the winner take all film link right in the chat box. So you have it there. Uh, the next thank you, profound thank you that I would like to give is to the uh, League of Women Voters of Larimer County. Thank you so much to Ann and to Kathleen. Uh, who have done a yeoman's job of pulling this together today. Um, whew, I think Senator Foote's with us. 
Senator, I'm going to mute you for just a sec to like introduce you. Don't want to mute you until you're introduced. <laughs> so I'm going to introduce Senator Foote. Um, so Senator Foote is, he currently represents Senate District 17, which is real close to you guys. Before that, he served for six years in the Colorado House of Representatives. He is the chair of the State Veterans and Military Affairs Committee. And in 2019, he was the Senate sponsor of SB 19-042, which is the National Popular Vote Bill. And before I unmute Senator Foote and uh, shrink myself on the screen, I did wanna just say just a little bit of housekeeping here. Uh, looks like most of you guys have already discovered the chat box, that's great. If you have questions for Senator Foote at any time, hit that tab that says questions right to the right of the chat tab and enter your question in there. So I'm gonna be reading the questions and arranging them and consolidating them and addressing them to Senator Foote. Uh, the next tab says polls. We're going to be doing a few polls just to shake things up so you guys aren't just listening to us, yak, yak, yak. Um, and one other quick thing is that uh, we have discovered, hopefully you guys have this too, if there's a little bell to the left of the chat box, that will take away all the pinging every time somebody enters something into the chat box. So with that said, here's Senator Foote. Thank you very much, Sylvia. And I unmuted myself a little bit uh, quicker than I should have. <laughs> but um, And thanks to everyone for joining us. I uh, really appreciate your time and your interest in popular vote interstate agreement. I, I think it'll be a good discussion tonight. Um, and I'm looking forward to, to hearing all of your questions. It's always a little bit tough to go after the dramatic music in, in the film, the winner take all film. It's a very well done film. Um, and uh, I really uh, am glad that you all had a chance to watch it before we go into talking about the national popular vote. Since you, you've watched it for half an hour, you have a, a really good background about what it is. Uh, I'm, I'm not gonna be talking all that much about what it is. I have a slideshow of about maybe eight slides or so that'll help guide the discussion and, and I'll put it up on the screen anyway so that you don't have to look at my face just talking to you the entire time. Um, and, uh, and we'll go through relatively quickly and, and then we'll open it for questions. I think the Q&A part is, is the much better part of these presentations anyway. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll see what's on your mind and see what we can do to help answer your questions. So um, the one thing I'll say right off the bat is that, of course, you watched a 30 minute documentary about the national popular vote. There's a number of questions people probably have. Um, and in fact, there's a lot that's been written about it. There's a lot that's out there about it. Uh, there's a lot of information and also some misinformation about it. In fact, there's also a book that I like to show everybody. It's a big, thick book, about a thousand pages long, uh, that has all the information you could possibly want about the national popular vote and also answers the questions that you may have after we get done with this webinar that come up, come to your mind afterwards. Uh, that book is available for free on the national popular vote website. Um, you can also buy it on Amazon for pretty cheap if you wanted to. But uh, it's, it's a great book to review if you want to get into any more detail. And that's yes on nationalpopularvote.com or the national site, which is just nationalpopularvote.com. But even though there's all this information, even though there's a book out there that's long and uh, has lots of information in it, really what the national popular vote comes down to is two things. And if you remember only two things from this entire webinar, uh, hopefully you'll remember these two things. Number one, the national popular vote is about every vote counting. Every vote matters, no matter where the voter lives, no matter what the election. And one person always equals one vote in the presidential race. Every vote matters. And number two, the most votes wins the presidency. And um, that's really what it comes down to. One person, one vote, the most votes wins. And those concepts should sound quite familiar to everybody because that's how we elect every other office holder. When you're vote, voting for your state senator or your U.S. senator, or anybody else, it's one person equals one vote. They all count, they all matter, no matter where that voter lives. And the most votes wins. And that's what the national popular vote would do to the presidency as well, if it's enacted by enough states. I think you heard in the movie, it's not been enacted by enough states. Colorado is one of 14 states, plus Washington, D.C. that has enacted it. Uh, but there needs to be more states that come on board before it actually goes into effect. So 
we're not going to see it for the 2020 election, um, but uh, perhaps we'll see it by 2024 if enough states come on board. So give me just a second. I'm going to um, pull up my uh, PowerPoint presentation here and take you through a couple things about the national popular vote before we open up for Q&A. Okay, the um, as mentioned in the movie, the national popular vote in Colorado actually uh, was really started with, or at least it's in law as Senate Bill 19-042. I was the Senate sponsor of Senate Bill 19-042 uh, the two House sponsors were Representative Jenny Arndt, who's uh, from Fort Collins, up close to you all, and, uh, and also Representative Emily Sirota from Denver. So we uh, were the ones that were able to pass the bill into law. The governor signed it last spring, sometime around March or so. He signed it into law. So it is currently our law. Um, I've been on the State Affairs Committee for uh, my entire time in the legislature. That's been, this is my eighth session. I've been the chair of it the last four years, and, and the reason why is because I really enjoy uh, policy about elections. I really am interested in passing policy that helps make sure that everybody has a voice and that those voices are heard in elections. My first session, I uh, was a, a supporter of our all mail-in ballot law that actually passed in 2013, despite a lot of resistance. A little bit uh, quaint at this point, but Certainly there was a lot of resistance at that point. There typically is resistance when we see some of these big changes when it comes to voting. Um, but uh, there's been a lot of good pro-voter reforms that have occurred since then. And um, quite simply, it's just uh, the reason why I wanted to uh, pass the national popular vote into Colorado law is because I think every vote should matter. I think every voter should matter. And I think a national popular vote election would change the way that we elect our president for the better. Right now, we have a lot of voters who know their voices aren't heard in the presidential race. And I think that uh, feeds into um, disillusion. I think that uh, leads to apathy. And uh, then we end up getting worse candidates and also worse office holders as a result. And if we want to um, improve our republic and improve our democracy, I think we need to make sure, first and foremost, that everybody's voice is heard. And that's why. I uh, am so enthusiastic about the national popular vote. So one thing I wanted to go over real quick is just the ballot language that you actually are going to see this, um, this November. And this is a little bit different than what we're used to on the ballot. We're used to, if somebody wants to put something into law that's not currently into law, that uh, they can gather enough signatures and put it on the ballot for people to try to put into the law. Right now, we're talking about the National Popular Vote Interstate Agreement, which is in Colorado law. And so the ballot measure that you're going to be seeing in November, uh, or when you get your ballots before that actually, is going to read this, like this. It's, shall the following act of the General Assembly be approved? Meaning that there's already something that's in our law, and so should it be approved by the majority of Coloradans? And that's an act concerning the adoption of an agreement among the states to elect the president by the National Popular Vote being Senate Bill 19-42. So if you uh, believe that one person should equal one vote, if you believe that the most votes should win the presidency, the most popular votes, that is, should win the presidency, then you should be a yes on this ballot measure because you are a yes on the national popular vote. So I just wanted to put that out there right at the beginning because sometimes people are a little bit confused about what's on the ballot and um, if they support the national popular vote, how should they vote? And that kind of thing. And of course, we can take more questions about that in the Q&A session if, if, you, uh, if you have any more. There's a couple uh, problems with the current way that we elect our president that's already been referenced in the movie as well as my opening remarks, but I'll just go over quite briefly that um, we have a problem of second place winners with our presidents. Uh, we have five out of our 45 presidents have been elected uh, after not winning the uh, most popular votes nationwide. And we've actually had a number of near misses as well. I mean, we know uh, we know about the two more two most recent ones, and th those were in 2000 and 2016. But um, over the last 100 years, there have been six near misses as well. Most recently, in 2004, had John Kerry flipped 60,000 votes in Ohio, which is not really that many. But if he would have flipped 60,000 votes in Ohio, then he would have ended up winning the presidency after having 
uh, lost the most popular vote in the country. He uh, lost by, I think, about a little over half a million popular votes across the country, maybe a little bit more than that. But if he would have flipped 60,000 votes in Ohio, he would have been the president in 2004. And there were several other near misses in uh, some of the years before that as well. The number two problem that we have with the current way that we elect our president, or at least the way that the current electoral college system is allocated, is that not all voters really have a chance to participate. I mean, sure, they can vote, of, of course, that some do, um, not the majority in some states, unfortunately, but some do vote. But many of those votes don't matter on several, several different le levels. The first level is that, of course, in a winner-take-all system, um, those that don't vote with the majority in a particular state, their votes are tossed aside and not reflected in the electoral college votes that are ultimately cast for one presidential candidate or the next. So already we have the minority in every state that has a winner-take-all system, which is 48 out of 50 states now, that has their votes cast aside. So if you um, or if somebody wants to vote for the Democratic candidate in Mississippi, for example, a very red state, or if somebody wants to vote for the um, Republican candidate in in, uh, in uh, Illinois or Rhode Island, which are both blue states, um, their votes for president are just going to be tossed aside. They aren't going to matter, and, and people know that. A lot of people know that, which is why uh, I'll get into a little bit later why we see voter turnout so low in some of those states. But um, not only are their votes just cast aside, but we also have an issue with most states being ignored during the course of the general campaign for the presidency. Um, once we get to the general campaign, presidential candidates know that they have to win just a handful of swing states in order to win the election, because most of the most of the states in the country are safely red or safely blue. Um, in fact, uh, really, there's hardly any states now. There's just a half dozen really states, maybe seven, that are considered to be swing states at this point in time. The rest of them are considered to be safely red or safely blue, and therefore, the presidential candidates don't worry about those states. They don't spend any money in those states. They don't organize in those states. They don't spend money for TV commercials in those states. They don't speak to those voters. They don't care what those voters think because those voters don't really matter. What matters are the voters in the swing states. And also, of course, with the way presidential campaigns are now, they're very data-driven. And it's it's more about just certain segments of those swing states that really matter, say that I-4 corridor in Florida, for example, we hear about all the time. Um, and so it's really just a small number of voters in a small number of states that really, truly matter in a presidential camp campaign. And also, once the president is elected, it's those same small number of voters in the small number of states that matter in order to ensure a re-election if the president is going to run for re-election. Governor Scott Walker, the former Republican governor of, of um of Wisconsin is not someone that I typically quote, but in this way, he was very much on point. He was asked what he really brings to the table when he was running for the Republican nomination for president back for the 2016 election. And what he brought to the table in his mind, among other things, was the fact that he was the governor of a swing state. And that's a state that the president uh, or the uh, winning candidate has to win in order to assume the presidency. And so he said, the nation as a whole is not going to elect the next president. 12 states are. And that was true back in 2016. Now, if you were to revise it for 2020, it would be even less number of states. So we see, for example, the number of visits that presidential candidates make to states. And, and this is just one metric. There's many metrics, of course, of how much a presidential uh, candidate cares about a state or cares about winning a particular state. Visits is one of them. How much they spend is another, whether or not they poll in those states is another, and you can go down the line. But if you look at strictly the number of visits, it's pretty striking uh, what we see. In 2012, we saw these visits that are on the map there, and the numbers correspond to the number of visits to those particular states during the uh, general election season. And you can see that um, it's very much focused on just a small number of states. We have the usual suspect of Florida in there. We have Ohio, which was a swing state up till recently and maybe in the future, if maybe. But uh, Virginia, North Carolina, Colorado was part of that in 2012. And we'll go a little bit over Colorado and what we foresee uh, for Colorado in the future um, in a couple of slides. But 
You can see also in 2016, this didn't really change a lot, except maybe uh, it was even more concentrated in just a couple of states. You can definitely tell the swing states, or at least what the presidential candidate saw is that the swing states by these numbers here, Florida, North Carolina, Virginia, Pennsylvania, Ohio, uh, and to a little bit lesser extent, Michigan and Wisconsin, which actually weren't really visited by the Democratic candidate, but the Republican candidate did visit many times. So um, this is the map that the presidential candidates see. This is the map that they know that they have to master in order to win the presidency. And you'll see that their resources, their time, and their efforts are concentrated on, on those small number of states. And, and that's it. Those are the voters they hear from. Those are the voters they have to react to, which means that the hundreds of millions of Americans that are not in those states are not really on the radar screen for those presidential candidates. We're all familiar with the red-blue map. Um, this shows what most uh, analysts uh, see as being the swing states in 2020. You can see by kind of the fuchsia color here, these are considered to be swing states. Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Florida, um, Arizona. Um, maybe Georgia in certain circumstances. But uh, this is what they typically see. You'll notice that Colorado is not on this map. Uh, or it's on the map. <laughs> it's on the map, but it's not on the map as a swing state. Um, and uh, that's because there's really no credible analyst and no analysis that I've seen um, from political commentators and otherwise that see Colorado as being a swing state in 2020. It's seen as a safely blue state for the purposes of the presidential campaign. Um, and uh, that doesn't mean that it's a safely blue state for everything. Of course, there still will be Republican winners in congressional seats and, and perhaps the uh, U.S. Senate race. But uh, for the purpose of the presidential race, neither the Democratic or Republican campaigns see Colorado as being a swing state, which means, unlike in previous years, uh, we will not be receiving those visits. We will not be receiving um, a lot of the resources. And Coloradans will just not be on the map for uh, the presidential campaigns. This is really what the presidential candidate, they see the country divided up like this because these are the states that they have to win, or at least they have to win a majority of these states in order to win the presidency. Now, it's not really um, uh, classified by big states, small states necessarily. New Hampshire may be a kind of a swing state at this point. It was in 2016, but um, and it's, it's classified by which states are closely divided, which states are considered to be toss-ups. That's it. That's what they care about. Those are the states they need to win in order to win the presidency, and those are the states they're going to campaign in. As I mentioned before, Colorado is not considered to be a swing state anymore. We are now what some call a jilted swing state, which I guess means that we know what it was like to be a swing state, and some people enjoyed it. Some people didn't because they had to watch all the commercials, but we're not going to really worry. have to worry about that so much this year. What's really interesting and what really um, I think matters when it comes to a national popular vote is this statistic about voter turnout. As it turns out, voters that are in swing states realize their vote really does matter and they're much more likely to get out to vote. And those that are not in swing states, whether it be big states or small states, red or blue, they realize that if they're likely to vote in the minority, it doesn't really matter. And also those that are likely to vote in the majority are less likely to turn out as well because they realize how the state's going to go. They know it's going to go red or it's going to go blue. I mean, look at these turnout figures in big states like Texas and California. That's less than one of two eligible, eligible voters in those states actually voted in the 2016 election. In Hawaii, it was uh, just a little bit more than a third, which is crazy. But uh, in the swing states, it's a lot higher. They get it. They understand that their vote really matters and Therefore, their turnout is typically about 15 points higher than in non-swing states. That's one of the great things about the national popular vote. When one person really equals one vote and all votes matter, um, I believe, and many others share this feeling, I believe that it's going to increase turnout, which is going to be good for our system all around for so many different reasons. Really what it comes down to, as I said, uh, again, is one person equals one vote. Every vote matters, no matter where the voter lives, no matter what the election. The Democratic voter in Mississippi, the Republican voter in Illinois, all those votes count towards the grand total. And then 
wins the presidency. And that's the beauty of the national popular vote interstate agreement if it goes into effect once enough states come on board. Um, these last two slides, I'm not going to go through in any great detail because you already know about this. Um, but again, the national popular vote is an agreement amongst the states to use their electors in a way that um, are awarded to the candidate that wins the most votes nationwide instead of just the most votes within that particular state. The candidate that wins the most votes nationwide, the most popular votes that is, will be the one that's president uh, without exception. It works through the Constitution. Article 2, Section 1 of the United States Constitution gives the states plenary authority, which is exclusive authority, to allocate their electors in the way that they see appropriate. And in fact, states have done that many different times over the course of our history. It just so happens over the last 50 years or so, most states, in fact, the vast majority of states have been a winner take all, but there certainly is nothing in the Constitution that requires that. Again, just to reiterate, this is the background you're going to see. And uh, if you do believe in one person, one vote, if you believe the most popular vote should win the presidency, then we hope that you will be voting yes on the national popular vote and voting yes on the see it in the fall. If you do uh, agree with the national popular vote and uh, you're as enthusiastic about it as we are, there's plenty of ways to get involved. This is just like any other statewide campaign. We need people to help out in various ways, and you can certainly do that through the two websites that I've mentioned um, down at the bottom. Yes, on nationalpopularvote.com or just nationalpopularvote.com. Uh, on the nationalpopularvote.com website, I referenced this a little bit before with this uh, book that I showed you. But uh, if you happen to be in a conversation with somebody and they bring up something that we don't address here or you don't remember the answer to, you can go and, and you can take a look at uh, the uh, chapters. And there's just a very good table of contents here where you can easily click to uh, some of the information that will help you talk about the national popular vote. And of course, I'm always available for questions as well and further dialogue and discussion. My email address is here. My phone number is there as well. And I hope that you'll get in touch if, if you wanted to talk about it further. So um, having said that, I'm going to click out of the PowerPoint now and I think turn it over to Sylvia, who's going to be running these questions and polling. And uh, we'll see who has questions and, and go from there. Awesome. Thanks, Senator Foote. Uh, so just so that uh, Senator Foote can take a deep breath and uh, close out the PowerPoint and all that. Uh, let's do our first poll. I have put a poll up there asking uh, sort of a pop quiz about his uh, presentation. So what percent of all campaign visits occurred in the 12 swing states in the 2016 general election? So if you guys could just head on over to the polls tab, it was either half of all visits 75%, 94%, or 100%? And uh, this is a little bit of a trick question because we actually have the answer for both the 2016 and the 2012 elections up there. But uh, you guys are doing great. I'm going to give it just a little bit more time to get a few more votes in and see how closely you are listening. All right, we've got about, most of you have now voted and it's just about an exact tie between 75% and 94%. Uh, the actual answer is 94% of all uh, campaign visits happened in the 12 swing states, leaving the rest of the country out in the cold. Somebody did vote for 100%. That was actually true in 2012. But in 2016, it was 94% happened in 12 states. So, Senator Foote, let's start getting into some of these questions. We have a lot of questions. So this is a great group. We love lots and lots of questions. Uh, so I'm going to start with the first question that was submitted from Karen Carmichael. Karen asks, do you know what other states are considering an NPV bill? Are there enough that would have sufficient electoral college votes to make up the 74 deficit to reach 270? 
Uh, not at this point, no. Um, the national popular vote is not going to be in effect for the 2020 election. I can say that with 99.9% um, .9 certainty. <laughs> Probably 100% certainty, but it seems as though in elections, nothing's ever 100%. But um, it, it uh, was being considered in a number of other states um, prior to COVID. And many of those legislatures have gone on some kind of a, a hiatus, just like we have here in Colorado. So it's uh, pretty safe to say that it would be very difficult um, for it to pass, I think, this year in most, if not all, those states. But I, I know the states where it's being considered this year, where it was being considered this year, include Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina. I think also maybe Minnesota, perhaps Michigan. Uh, Georgia, I think, was one of them, too. You know, the national popular vote has been introduced in most states at this point in time, and in many states it's been introduced several times. In Colorado, it was introduced several times before it passed as well. It's, it's, a, it's a long process um, for it to pass in, in, uh, in states typically. Not always, but typically. And um, so even if we didn't have the COVID thing to worry about, I still think it, 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 it would not have passed in all of those states that it was introduced in. But it's, it's uh, being considered around the country, just like it uh, has been in many other years. The first national popular vote interstate agreement law was passed in 2000. Um, I'm sorry, in 2007, it was first introduced in 06, but it passed in 07 in Maryland. That was the first state. And since then it's been introduced in several states and, Usually it passes in say one to two or three states per year. Last year it passed in four states, Colorado, New Mexico, Delaware, and Oregon were the four states that adopted it last year. But it's not going to have enough, to answer your question that you originally asked, it's not going to have enough um, participation by the 2020 election for it to take effect by 2020. So it'd be 2024 at the earliest. Uh, Beth, D. Haven is saying that she understands that the repeal of the NPV bill will be on the ballot in November. She would like to know what our plans are to defeat this repeal effort. Yeah, well, um, lots of things. As I mentioned before, we're running a statewide campaign. It's going to have all the hallmarks of a statewide campaign. We're fundraising, we're grassroots organizing, we're going to have stuff on social. We're going to have stuff on TV. I mean, it's going to be all around, just like any other statewide campaign, to talk to people why they should vote yes on the national popular vote, why they should approve what the legislature has done. Um, these webinars are part of that. Um, it's it's going to be like any other campaign that you've seen throughout the state. And, and we're focusing throughout the state, of course. I mean, right now we're talking, I'm assuming that everyone on this is in Larimer County, but we already have been around the, everywhere from Logan County to La Plata County to Alamosa to Aurora and everywhere in between. We've been around the state already and we will continue to focus on every place around the state because we firmly believe that every vote matters and we want to make sure that we have the majority of Coloradans that that uh, vote yes and uh, that they approve of the national popular vote. So stay tuned. But if you want to be involved, as I said, there's plenty of ways to do that from donations to getting the word out to sharing social media and everything in between. And I hope that you'll consider that if you're a yes on national popular vote. And I would like to jump in there with a, uh, a shout out to the League of Women Voters around the state. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the League has been our partner in this, really, and uh, incredibly supportive. And they've been sponsoring talks all around the state. And, uh, you know, just I don't think we could do this without them. So thank goodness for the League of Women Voters. Yeah, and I don't know if it was mentioned at the beginning, but I always find it very um, interesting that the League of Women Voters were, have actually been on board with a direct election or a national popular vote for a really long time. They first passed a resolution, I believe, in 1970 supporting yeah. a national popular vote, and uh, I know they passed a resolution back in 2010 supporting the national popular vote interstate agreement. So this has been a long time position uh, of the League, and and we appreciate that, and, and I'm glad that we're able to work together to, to make sure we get a yes vote this fall. So, Senator Foote, I'm going to ask one more question, then we're going to go to another poll, and then we're going to get back to the questions, and the questions are just pouring in here. Um, <laughs> so, Sonia is asking, how would you respond to a conservative who readily mentions that all the examples show uh, show 
how Dems would have won if NPV were in place. So why would they want this? What's an example of where an R lost because of the Electoral College? Well, I think you'd have to go back to the 1800s. Those were the uh, three other times that the winner of the um, uh, national popular vote actually lost. Um, 1824 was the first, 1888, 1876 were the other two. And, you know, the, the parties were a lot different then, so I'm not really sure there's a very good parallel there. Um, but the last two times, it's true that uh, de the Democratic candidate would have would have won um, had a national popular vote been in place. But the national popular vote idea has long been a bipartisan idea. And that's because I think everybody really grasps the significance and uh, of the most votes winning the presidency. Um, if you're a Republican, you should have confidence that your candidate is going to win the most votes nationwide. If, and the same goes for, for, the, uh, for Democrats. They should have confidence that they're candidate's going to win the most votes nationwide. Um, so um, it's certainly not a Democratic or Republican thing, although unfortunately some of the debate here in Colorado recently has, has uh, uh, at least some of the opposition is, has been firmly in the Republican camp, and that's unfortunate because over the years the national popular vote has been quite bipartisan. The national popular vote interstate agreement has had um, hundreds of Republican co-sponsors in the legislature around the country when the bills have been debated there. Um, the national popular vote national organization is is divided uh, amongst Republican and Democratic supporters. So it's it's quite a bipartisan effort, even though maybe the opposition currently may um, want you to think otherwise. But it's it's been uh, a bipartisan effort. And, and I guess to answer your question directly, if I was talking to a conservative and, and they were concerned about it, I would ask them, why are they so concerned about it? If, if they're right, if they, if they have good candidates and they have good policies for the country, the majority of the voters should agree with them and they should be elected. That's, that's the whole point. Well, and again, back to the point that you made during your presentation that in 2004, this came within a hair's breadth of happening to the Republican candidate, to George Bush. It hadn't been for just under 60,000 votes, uh, you know, we, we wouldn't be having this conversation. We would probably have a national popular vote. Um, I am actually changed my mind. There is a question here that would be a really great setup for our next poll. So I'm gonna ask you this question and then we'll go to the poll. Um, so Mary Pace, who I, I actually think from the chat box is Jeff Pace uh, is asking, says it seems like this compact opens to re regional presidencies given the population of New York, Texas, Florida, and California. Why wouldn't that shift presidential priorities to those states and away from the lightly populated Western states to Colorado's disadvantage? Uh, yeah, good question. I mean, I'll, I, I might address it a couple different ways. The first is, is that the lightly populated states in the West are not, um, no one's paying attention to them now as it is anyway. I mean, as, as we mentioned, Colorado was was a swing state. It's not anymore. Uh, but uh, for an even better example, look at some of our neighbors. Look at Utah, look at Kansas, look at South Dakota, North Dakota, Oklahoma. I mean, all of these states are states that are, uh, I guess, lightly populated or more rural states. And they're not getting any attention from the presidential candidates. And it's not because that they're red states or blue states. The same goes for New Mexico, actually, which is a safely blue state at this point. Uh, it's not because they're red or blue. It's that they're not swing states. And you can just go across the country and take a look at the smallest state like Rhode Island and uh, the biggest state like Alaska, biggest geographic state at least like Alaska or, or Hawaii, whatever. None of those states get any kind of attention during the general campaign because they're not swing states. And so um, I think you have to look at it through that lens as well. Um, the current system is not working very well as it is now. Um, if, if what you think should happen, which is that uh, the most people should get attention, that the most votes should be sought, the presidential candidates should go across the country and try to get votes from everywhere. If, if that's what you think that the candidates should do, then the current system is not doing that at all. Um, now, to your issue about regionalism or focusing on a particular state like California, 
I, I would just encourage you to do the math. Um, the math just is not there to win the majority of votes if you focus on one or even two regions or the state of California. Uh, let's take a look at California and New York combined. You know, combined, they make up 18% of our population. Um, so their electoral college votes reflect that. That's how our current system is now, of course. Um, but the 18% population is a lot less than 50% of what it takes to win. And that's even assuming that one candidate could get everybody in California and everybody in New York to vote for that particular candidate. We know that's not the case. We know there's millions of Republican voters in California, millions of Republican voters in uh, New York, just like there's millions of Democratic voters in Texas. Um, and so the numbers just don't add up. Um, in fact, uh, to, to, to focus on uh, a region like the West Coast or the Northeast, I, I suppose the candidates could do that, but it would be very much a losing strategy. They just would not have enough numbers to win. In order to win, just like in a statewide race, just like here in Colorado, in order to win Colorado statewide, you have to focus on all parts of the state. You can't just be in Denver and just try to pick up as many votes as you possibly can in Denver. You have to go out to the Western Slope. You have to go to the Eastern Plains. You have to go to Durango. You have to go um, to Fort Morgan and places in between, or at least you have to focus on those voters. The Democratic candidate is, uh, as of now, probably not going to win a majority of votes in Mesa County, but they have to get some votes in Mesa County. Just like the Republican candidate is probably not going to win the most votes in the city of Denver, but they have to get some votes in Denver, and they have to focus there as well. So if you look at how statewide campaigns are run, it's like that. And I think a nationwide campaign would be run the same way as well. Presidential candidates focusing on one region or one state would, that would be a losing strategy. Uh, the, the, as I said, the math just does not add up. So the reason uh, you'll, the reason why I held off on that last poll will now become obvious. Uh, the, the poll is asking, what percent of the country's population do California and New York actually <laughs> account for? <laughs> Sorry, I spoiled that, Sylvia. <laughs> That's okay. It's it's like in school, right? We, we <laughs> if you guys were paying attention, the answer was given right to you, and by God, everybody's getting it right. So <laughs> you guys are paying attention. That's great. Yeah, let me throw out uh, while everyone's doing that poll. Let me throw out another. Um, a bit of numbers too, just for people that like to do the electoral math. Um, uh, some people in, in, in this question, I think might've gone to this particular issue. So I'll just uh, address it up front. It's about whether or not um, big cities would be focused upon rather than the entire country or at the detriment of rural areas. One thing I wanna point out about those figures in, in the math is that again, if a candidate were to focus just on big cities, the votes just are not there. We have to remember that the city of Denver, for example, while it did vote majority for uh, the Democrat in the last several presidential elections, there's still a lot of people that voted for the Republicans. So it's not homogenous. But um, anyway, if you take the top 100 cities in the country, that makes up 18% of our population. And as it turns out, at least over the last several elections, 60% of the voters in those top 100 cities have voted Democratic, 40% have voted Republican. Now, if you flip it on the other side and you take the rural areas of the country, the rural areas of the country actually make up also 18% of our population. So it's the same amount of people, give or take a few thousand, uh, that the top 100 cities have. And as it turns out, the rural areas of the country vote, or at least they have over the last several elections, 60% Republican, 40% Democratic. So a mirror image of the... Uh, of the top 100 cities. Now the remainder of the two thirds of the population lives in suburban areas and they've been splitting down the middle 50-50 for the Republican and Democratic candidates. So again, if you're a candidate that just focuses on the rural areas and that 18% that's in the rural areas, that's gonna be a losing strategy. Just like if you were a candidate that focuses on the top 100 cities, uh, that's gonna be a losing strategy. You have to focus on the country you have to get the most votes nationwide in order to become president. And that's really how it should be. Yeah. Um, so this next question is from Bill Thompson. And I believe Bill is Ann Thompson's husband, who is the, the president of the Larimer League. And uh, 
how how were you at history, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> Depends on the history. I, I was a Cold War history buff when I was in college, but uh, you know some of that's faded from memory. I have to okay, say. Okay, well let's <laughs> let's see if we can get those cobwebs out. So here's what Bell says in Hamilton's introductory paragraph to number sixty to number sixty eight. I, I don't know if that's Federalist Papers or, or what. Yeah, it sounds like it. He states, quote, if the manner of it, it referring to the Electoral College, be not perfect, at least it is excellent. If Hamilton were alive today, do you think he would still hold this opinion? <laughs> oh, well, that's a good question. I've that question before. That's a great one. Yeah, that's a creative one. I, uh, well, so I want to say a couple of things about that. First of all, um, as you know, the national popular vote keeps the Electoral College intact. And so um, I think that Hamilton would recognize that, uh, it, that the Electoral College is still intact with the national popular vote interstate agreement, and I think he would appreciate that. Um, he would also recognize, uh, I think, that, that states um, have the ability to allocate their electors in a way that they think is appropriate because he, among others, made that very clear in Article 2, Section 1. And in fact, while he was still living, as well as the other founders, they saw many states go through many different ways of allocating their electors. Uh, sometimes it was just the governor selected the electors, and then the electors voted for the presidential candidate they thought was appropriate. Sometimes it was the state legislatures. Um, sometimes it was uh, proportional. Um, and sometimes it was winner take all. But neither Hamilton nor any of the other founders specified in the Constitution how the electors should be allocated. And, and um, part of that was because the issue of how to elect the chief executive, how to elect the president, was actually an issue that, that uh, they could not agree on, really, until the very end. I mean, they agreed on most of the major compromises at a certain point, and, and months went by before they actually finished up the document. One of the main things that was holding them back was how do you elect the president? Do you elect the president like a parliamentary system? Do you elect the president with a direct election? Do you uh, elect it in some of the other ways that are proposed? And the founders went through many arguments and, and uh, many changed their minds over the course of the arguments. And what they eventually came up with was basically a way to punt it to the states and have the states decide. And that was uh, consistent with the federal principles that were uh, ultimately enshrined in the Constitution. So I think at the end of the day, um, Hamilton would um, recognize that uh, what the national popular vote is doing is within the, the bounds set out through the Constitution. And uh, I hope he would appreciate that the states could go into this kind of agreement and elect the, the president by a national popular vote. I know that many of the founders, even those that signed off on, uh, of course, the, the ones that signed off on, on uh, the electoral college system, uh, as they went later in life, proposed amendments to the Electoral College system. They had misgivings about how it was set. Um, and they wrote many things talking about how it should be different. Um, so uh, Hamilton's writing is, is uh, reflective of his thinking and that has to be respected. I think others felt differently. But at the end of the day, I think, um, and I hope that Hamilton would recognize that we're working within the Constitution and, and uh, and the power that the states, uh, they were wise when they gave the power to the states to try to decide how best to elect our chief executive. And I, I got to admit, I'm a little disappointed you didn't do that by rapping. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to see that. <laughs> um, and yeah, just to add one more thing in there that I, I heard recently that I thought was really interesting is that uh, James Madison apparently proposed a constitutional amendment to outlaw winner-take-all systems in the states. Uh, hmm. This was a few years after passing the Constitution. He was so horrified by what was happening with winner-take-all that he, he wanted to eliminate it, but he wasn't successful. Um, okay, now we have a question from Karen Carmichael. Karen asks, if the ballot measure on NPV is not approved in no, the November election, does that void slash overturn the NPV passed by the Colorado legislature? Most bills do not need to pass voter approval. Why does this one? 
Yeah, good question. So first of all, we have a real opportunity this year to uh, make sure that the majority of Coloradans vote yes and approve the national popular vote, because I think that'll send a really strong signal to other states across the country that are considering this, that the national popular vote is indeed popular. Um, this is really the first time, actually, that this has gone to a statewide vote. It's in, in all the other states that have that have enacted it or at least become part of the agreement. It's just been done by the legislature. Now, we here in Colorado are pretty unique. I, actually, I'm not aware of any other state that has it this way, but we have in our Constitution a provision that allows voters to put on the ballot uh, a provision requiring a statewide approval of things that the legislature has done in certain circumstances. And so um, if you're a real legislature junkie, you can take a look at the bottom of every single bill that is proposed as well as every bill that passes. And at the bottom of each one of those bills, there's either a safety clause or a petition clause. The safety clause is put on bills um, or it should be put on bills where the passage of the bill um, is something that, uh, or I should say the inaction of the bill is something that should happen ASAP due to public health, safety, or other concerns of that nature. Um, the petition clause is put on other bills that don't match that criteria. So um, if you're passing a bill that deals with uh, some kind of public health issue, you put a safety clause on there and it is not eligible for um, voter approval in, in the next statewide election. But the petition clause is eligible for voter approval in uh, a general election. And that's what happened here with the national popular vote. This was eligible for the safety clause. It did not deal with the immediate public health or safety of Coloradans. And so like many other bills that we pass, uh, it, it is subject to approval if um, enough signatures are gathered throughout the state in order what happened here in this case. So it's subject to approval and uh, we're confident that it will be approved, but of course we need everybody's help to make sure that we get the word out and people vote yes. Okay. Um, Jane Everham asks, what are the major points that the opposition is relying on? So what, what's the other side saying, Mike? Uh, well, we went over a couple of those right now with a, um, I think the the other question it was the uh, Cal you know the, I call it the California issue, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know the opponents uh, of uh, one person one vote unfortunately seem to be very focused on California they're very obsessed with California we're much more focused on Colorado voters and making sure that every Coloradan has their voice heard and every Coloradan has their vo their uh, vote count but um, they will bring up the California thing time and again. As I mentioned before, the, the math just doesn't add up there. Um, but I mean, as a slogan, I, I guess it's a decent slogan. It uh, gets their point across. It's now, I mean, talking points don't necessarily have to be true. And in this case, it's not. But uh, that's probably what you're likely to hear from the opponents of one person, one vote is the, the California issue. The other one is related to that, which I went over as well. And that's kind of the urban rural issue. Um, again, the math doesn't add up there. Presidential candidates will have to uh, campaign throughout the country and focus on voters across the country in order to get the most number of votes to win. And that includes rural areas, urban areas, suburban areas. Um, unlike the current system where the presidential candidates just focus on maybe six states. So um, those are really the two main points that are brought up. Uh, and so um, um, if you have further questions about them, I'm happy to go into more detail, but that's what you're likely to hear from the opponents of one person, one vote. And then we've, we've started hearing a weird one about water rights now too, which just makes no sense at all. But oh yeah, you want to say something yeah. about that just to put that to bed right now? Yeah, that's, that's not even, I mean, you know, talking points and slogans are one thing, but the water rights issue is just blatantly false. Um, one of the things they talked about recently is that if you were to elect a president by a national popular vote, then that would mean that, I'm not sure if I'm going to get this exactly right, that would mean that um, Colorado would lose out in water rights negotiations with other states like California and Arizona, because those are, particularly California is a bigger state. So I think what they're referring to is water rights compacts, interstate com compacts for water rights, which... Um, 
I, I think most people realize that uh, interstate compacts of certain nature um, are subject to congressional approval. Some are not, like the National Popular Vote Agreement, um, but some are. And uh, to the extent that a uh, interstate compact between two states or multiple states regarding water rights would be subject to congressional approval, that's fine, but it's just congressional approval. The president has nothing to do with it. So how we elect the president has nothing to do with water rights whatsoever. Um, but I suppose that there's a number of people in Colorado that um, are very laser focused on water rights as they should be. And um, that can be a scary proposition, but the president has nothing to do with interstate water rights. Um, even if it comes to an interstate compact that has to be approved by Congress. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Kathy Kipp, uh, I believe Representative uh, Kipp uh, is asking, can you address the allocation of federal dollars to swing states versus non-swing states in both normal times and in times of disaster? Yeah, that's interesting. Thanks, Kathy, for being on this webcast and thanks for your support of the National Popular Vote. Really appreciate that and all the good work you're doing for your district up there. Um, so it's very interesting, you know, we, we've talked a lot about, or I guess I've talked a lot about, <laughs> um, the uh, uh, allocation of resources when it comes to campaigning. You know, the presidential candidates just focus on certain states in order to get the not enough votes to win. Um, that also translates over to governing as well, particularly if a president is trying to win re-election. If they're trying to win re-election, they focus a lot more on those states that they need to win in order to win the presidency again. So, um, uh, when it comes to federal grants, when it comes to visits during the presidency, when it comes to paying attention, you know states like Florida, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, they're getting a lot more of that than other states are. One very recent example that's come up has been in the context of COVID-19, and that is that the state of Florida, amazingly enough, has received 100% of its requests from the feds when it comes to PPE supplies and other COVID relief supplies, 100% Florida is received. The state of Colorado amongst, uh, I think almost every other state um, has not received uh, nearly that much. Colorado in fact has been just a fraction of what is requested. There's a number of factors that go into that I'll admit, but it sure is suspicious that the state of Florida uh, received 100% right off the bat um, and it just so happens that the current president has to win Florida in order to win the presidency again. So we see that a lot. It's not just with the COVID-19 supplies. We see that with federal grants. We see it with disaster declarations. We see it with all kinds of federal policies. We see it across the board. And it makes sense because the presidents know they have to win those states in order to win again. And so they're not going to put those states out in the cold. They're going to make sure they take care of those states to the extent they can. Great question, Kathy. Um, I think we have time for a couple more. I'm just, I'm not gonna ask any more polls because we do have so many questions. And, and I will say that uh, apologies, we're not gonna be able to get to all these questions. Some of them have been sort of addressed before. So uh, please don't uh, be offended if I haven't gotten to your question. Kathleen Schmidt is asking, will state political parties still appoint electors with the NPV interstate compact? Yeah, I mean, if they choose to, you know, every state's different, but the state of Colorado, currently the parties select the electors and uh, the electors are, um, uh, they go through the party process. Currently Democrats and Republicans have a different process by which they select their slate of electors. And uh, currently under the winner take all system, whichever candidate gets the most votes in Colorado, that uh, party ends up uh, appointing the electors. So in 2016, there were nine Democratic electors uh, that were appointed for Colorado. Uh, the way that would change would be it's the most votes nationwide, the most popular votes nationwide. Those uh, party electors are the ones that are appointed in Colorado and the other states. So now that could change, you know, state law can change about how electors are selected. But uh, currently, that's the way it works, at least in Colorado. OK. Um, and I'm just reading something here about, yeah, I, I don't understand the question. Um, 
So we have a couple more minutes. Linda Thomas, this is going to be our last question. She says, one argument against the in national popular vote is that our electors go to the national popular vote, even if Colorado voters vote for the other candidate. Can you address that? Yeah. Um, so this is uh, how we make sure that every vote matters. Um, and uh, right now, Colorado, amongst the uh, 47 other states that have winner take all, um, only represents the candidate that won 50% plus one in the state of Colorado. So just going back to 2008, we've got three presidential elections, 08, 12, and 16. Um, the, all three were won by the Democratic candidate here in Colorado uh, by no more than 55%. So that means that 45% of the voters in Colorado actually voted for somebody else. Um, during those presidential campaigns or those presidential elections in 08 and 12 and 16, in fact, there were about 3.5 million Republican votes or votes for the Republican candidates during those years. Those 3.5 million Coloradans uh, turned into zero electoral votes from the state of Colorado. So the current system um, means that those that vote in the minority in every single state that have a winner take all system, they are just thrown out into the cold. They don't matter. And the national popular vote ensures that they do matter. Every voter from every state, um, every vote counts, every vote is equal, every voter is relevant, unlike the current system. So um, it's a way to make sure that every voice is heard and every vote counts, the national popular vote that is, unlike the current system. And that's why we're so excited about it. We wanna make sure that votes aren't thrown out anymore. We wanna make sure that every Coloradan's voice is heard and every Coloradan uh, vote counts, unlike the current system. Great, great way to end up. Um, and I am gonna put a, a button up here that you guys can click on. We really could use your help. Uh, as you know, running political campaigns is uh, expensive and we could sure use your donations or to sign up to volunteer. So if you click on that blue button, it'll take you directly to our website. So thank you, Senator Foote. Thank you to all of you who spent your evening with us. Uh, we really appreciate your support. And again, if you have any questions at all, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, Senator Foote put his email. Mine is just sylvia at yesonnationalpopularvote.com. And uh, thank you again. Thank you very much. Glad you tuned in. Bye. <laughs>